Hello, Sooner Nation, OU Insider, subscribers, Coach Brian Clinton fanatics, people who are confused and already exhausted by the transfer portal, and it hasn't even been two weeks yet. This is the podcast for you. This is the Oklahoma Drill, a podcast fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. My name is Jesse Crittenden, and I am joined, of course, as always, every week, every Wednesday, typically, by my co-host, Sir Coach Esquire, Brian Clinton. Brian, is it getting cold up your way? Is it getting cold at all? Cold. Hoodie weather. We got we got the hoodie on today. So we'll say we'll see. You say that, but it's always hoodie weather. For that's me. fair. Yeah. Every single that, day. That, that is totally fair. I I retract my statement or rescind my statement. <laughs> see, like for you, every day is ha- like a hat day. For me, every day is pullover yeah. day. Well, I mean, every day is hoodie day. I mean, I, mean you know. <laughs> I wish I could wear a hat. Uh, I've tried several times, um, but whether it's the fact that my head is massive or oddly shaped i have adam sandler syndrome i think with a, with an egg shaped head <laughs> um hats don't work for me is there a tip is there a secret no is it a state I, of mind no i mean I, my my hat like i i almost max these things out every time so i mean that's just i don't know one of these days if i don't if i let my hair get too long i literally can't wear a hat so that's why my hair is always short around the sides and just a little little hint there so i guess okay. that i guess that might help but if you have like i have a lumpy head up top so if i <laughs> if i uh if i cut it too short it looks funny maybe if you struggle from that uh i i just keep doing what you're doing man you look good so oh thanks man that's the hard <laughs> part is my hair gets kind of long sometimes but it's hard <laughs> because uh um, for one, I mostly just get lazy and two, my hair is really unique and thick, two cowlicks in the front, two in the back, and it makes it to where cutting it too short. It looks, it looks weird. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole, people did not come here to talk about my hair. <laughs> uh, they came here to listen to us talk about Oklahoma football primarily. And Brian, it, uh, the chaos never really stops in Norman, Oklahoma. And as soon as you think. But everything's kind of settled and everything's fallen into place. Something else changes. And there we've gotten a couple of examples of that. The first one being Danny Stutzman, after there being some confusion about whether he was going to stay or go, he's here. He's he's here to stay for one more year. You and I talked about that in an emergency pod on Monday. But Brian, the bigger thing, the one that I think has really sent shockwaves, is Caden Green entering the portal. True freshman. Offensive lineman Caden Green, for now, looks like he's potentially set to leave the program. And it was particularly crazy because, Brian, we were out, uh, you know, so it was open practice yesterday at OU. The media got to come in for 25 minutes. And we were just sitting, you know, uh, you know, we were just walking around. Oh, Jackson Arnold's quarterback one. How's it, you know, how's he look? Oh, there's Seth Luttrell. Oh, Danny Stutzman is in uniform. He's on the field. Uh, you know, Joe John Finley looks like he's taking a bigger role in the offensive drills. A lot to look at. What freshmen are are standing out? And as I'm as I'm walking out, someone says to me, or one of the reporters said to me, Caden Green just entered the portal. Caden K- Green, the the le- the true freshman left tackle, potential future NFL draft pick. Caden Green, is that who we're talking about? Something that nobody, I think, could have seen coming, and I know you do the same thing as I do, as other people do, that when you get to the end of the regular season, you look at the roster, what players are likely to enter the portal, what players are likely to declare for the draft, who's staying, you know, who's staying put. I don't think Caden Green was on anybody's list. Nope. Um, nobody. I don't think anybody could have seen this coming. And, and Brian, I don't want to speculate too much about why this has happened. Um and we also don't know what's going to happen. We really, we still don't know what's going to happen. But from a broad sense, what was your reaction to Caden Green entering the portal? And and what does this what does this mean for Oklahoma? Well, my initial reaction, I kind I kind of just got sick to my stomach a little bit, and not necessarily for for what for Oklahoma's sake, but just 
for the reality of just what college football has kind of become over the last couple of years, don't know really why, um, for, for, for sure why, uh, Caden Green decided to enter the portal, but I think we've just reached a point where for coaches, it's just really tough to know what you're going to have going into not just next season, but, but the bowl game from practice to practice almost. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really tough, uh, situation to, to put a coaching staff in, to put a roster in, um, and, you know, I, I think everybody, obviously, you have to look out for yourself uh, in, in every situation, and, and that's that that goes for players and coaches both. Uh, so it, it's just a tough situation. I, I As much as Caden Green has been outspoken um, with with his, his affirmation for Oklahoma and, and for the Sooners, and it just it just feels so out of left field. I, I, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. Shock and all was really like the, the, the best way of, of putting it. Um, what it means for Oklahoma, it means you need, you need some guys to, to step up and, and fill that other spot. I mean, now you're, you're losing five starters. I mean, yeah, Jacob Sexton did start the last couple of games at right tackle, but you know, Tyler Guyton was the guy there. I think that it it really just puts more, it puts more of an emphasis on on Oklahoma having to hit, as we spoke about last time. You have to hit on your portal additions this this time around. They can't just be depth pieces, and unfortunately, you're going to need to go and and get guys that are ready to contribute right away on the offensive line because some of the defensive lines you're facing next season, I just just off the cuff, Ole Miss. LSU, obviously Alabama, Texas. Uh, you've got I mean, Auburn's on the list there. Missouri, uh, yeah. I mean Tennessee, yeah. You're you you've got really stout defensive lines that you're gonna have to face, and uh, you know you, you don't want to have offensive line being an issue, especially with a freshman quarterback uh, back there who you know you're kind of building your entire future around. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's tough, and and I I don't know how it's going to end up playing out for Oklahoma, but um, obviously wish wish both sides the best and and hope that it works out in, in better favor for both of them. This episode of the Oklahoma Drill Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. The leaders in below the waist grooming have just launched their fifth generation performance package to help you avoid another silent night in the bedroom this year. Take care of your special snowflake with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra and watch your South Pole shine like never before. Get the best stocking stuffer of all by going to manscaped.com and using code OUINSIDER for 20% off plus free shipping. Mrs. Claus will thank you. Manscaped is a one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. They have the perfect gift in the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, which includes loads of perfect stocking stuffers. What could be better than giving the gift of good hygiene? and a few laughs. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is the crown jewel of the holidays and dare I say the best ball trimmer of all time. The Electric Razor's advanced skin safe technology is a lifesaver and known for reducing nicks and cuts on his Santa sack. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code OUINSIDER at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code OUINSIDER. Say ho 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 to a well-groomed mistletoe with Manscaped. Uh, I mean, you touched on it. Brian, but I think this is, again, I, I don't want to speculate too much and that's, that's going to happen. And that's, that's the name of the game, but we, we really don't know. No, I mean, not only did no, no outlet saw it coming, no reporter saw it coming. The team really, for the most part, which was didn't know. like that. Yeah. yeah. We asked McCade Matower about it after practice. He genuinely didn't know. Um, he thought he said it was a little odd that Caden Green was not at practice. That was something that I noticed as soon as I got to practice, as soon as they got into individual drills, it's oh, Caden Green's not not on the field. But even McCade said it afterwards. I thought maybe he was just taking a test. Thought maybe it's finals week. Maybe he's taking yeah. a final. Um, the thing for the and again, we we don't know what's going to happen uh, on either side of this. This is this is tough. This is a, this is a tough, unexpected turn for OU because I think the offensive line was already going to be uh, a question mark going into next season. You're losing Andrew Rame, you're losing Tyler Guyton, uh, you're losing Walter Rouse, uh, you know, McCade Matower. 
you were likely going to have to, you know, replace at least four starting offensive linemen. Now, now, um, Caden Green saw playing time, a lot of playing time over the second half of the season. He played 568 snaps per pro, pro football focus. He started four mm-hmm. games. It's just, it's not only just about replacing the offensive line going into your first season in the SEC. That was always good. That was going to be tough anyways, even with Caden Green and Jacob Sexton on board. But you just don't see many true freshman offensive linemen who see that many snaps in their first year show that they have potential and show and prove themselves to somebody you can build around on the offensive line when they're not even a year into their, their career yet. Right. It, it's hard. It, it's just, it's tough. And I think when you combine that with, um, you know, Brent Venable said it at the Alamo Bowl press conference last week that their goal was to take 35 to 37 scholarship players with 27 of them being high school recruits that leaves roughly eight to ten transfer recruits that you can get, or tr- or you can get on scholarship yeah. at least. OU's already used three of those, and you know they, th- you know, fortunately for them, they did get Spencer Brown uh, out of Michigan State as as a tackle, you know, and I think that's that's exciting. But now all of a sudden, you're losing Caden Green. You already needed more help in the offensive line, anyways, and you have a very limited number of scholarships you can hand out and you have other positions of need too. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a doomsday scenario. I'm not saying every, all hope is lost for Oklahoma, but I, I think you're right too, from a broad transfer portal perspective, it's hard. Cause I've always been pro player. Mm-hmm. These are college kids. Yeah, absolutely. These are young kids at the end. I've, you know, it, it, since the transfer portal is, has taken off, there's always, you know, there's been that, well, it's more like the NFL now, kind of but the difference is even in the nfl yeah there are trades and stuff but those guys are under contract right these kids are not and it does make it harder from a i mean this the coaching staff had no idea this was right. coming. well and and there's nothing really keeping him here if he doesn't want to be here and again we don't know what happened and i am pro player but right it, it does make it hard from a team building perspective it just does right well and i want to make that perfectly clear that i i am pro player as well this you know i think nil is a great thing i think the transfer portal is a great thing unfortunately the minimal regulations on both of those things we we have a minimally regulated version of nfl free agency now there's very little regulations to what's going on, and both of them rose at the same time, and it's created a mess. And I think that that's the overarching the overarching theme of this is, you know, if there's there there is is tampering going on all over the country. Now, is that what happened in Caden Green's case? No clue. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But it's very clear. I mean, we've heard it at Washington State's Cam Ward had uh, what did he say seven different seven figure opportunities for for uh, before he even entered the portal before the window even opened i mean that's it, it's just the it's the world that we live in now um and, and things are just changing so rapidly it's hard to keep up with so i i don't know i think that the biggest thing to take away from caden green leaving for oklahoma's roster is you know I, everybody kind of just fit in maybe troy everett there at center um, who's an undersized guy and having a Caden green next to you makes that a little bit, it makes it okay in the, in the sec, you've got a guy that can help with double teams. Now you have to replace both of those guards and it's going to make that interior a little more of a question mark. I feel good about, I, I do want to say, I feel good about Sexton and I feel good about Brown being your, your bookends at tackle, but now there's just a lot of question marks. Joshua Bates is going to have to step up. I mean, you're going to have to see Jake uh, Jake Taylor uh, take a jump. So I, I don't know. It, there's a lot of question marks. Good news is I do trust that Bill Bedenboe is going to trot out an offensive line that is better than average because that's just that's what he does. He's a he's a technical genius when it comes to offensive line work. And if you were one of the people out there blaming him for Caden Green leaving, um, I'm going to kindly ask you to watch another show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is it hot. hot yeah, takes. It, I, I just, I don't know that that's one take that I've seen repeatedly on Twitter that I, I it just gets my blood boiling. Um, 
it's a it's a lazy take it, it, but again it is what it is so move on before i get on a soapbox jesse <laughs> spin fire spin fire i like it the only thing I, i'll say to kind of wrap it up brian is really what this comes down to is for for the bowl game ou will be okay they've still got mccade yep. Matower. yeah uh walter rouse is going to play um so, you know, between Troy Everett and Jacob Sexton and Aaron Parks and Jake Taylor, um, oh, you can be okay. But this really what this comes down to is moving forward that you don't OU has had some pretty decent carryover on the offensive line the last few years. This is going to be one of the biggest years in terms of how much production you're having to replace. Yep. And OU is getting a few guys in this upcoming uh freshman class um that i think they're that this program is really excited about and yeah. like i mentioned earlier they, they did land spencer brown i think that's huge um but this is going to be a pretty young offensive line unless ou makes some moves in the transfer portal which it, there is still some moves even to come in high school recruiting too yeah. uh one thing that was notable was uh there's ou has 26 players in its high school recruiting class right now and brent mentioned uh they were going to take 27 so it's your guard, you know, your guard situation may be figured out. Yeah, it Maybe. might be. Who knows? It might be. But either way, it is young, and I, and I don't think it's or the offensive line is going to be young. I don't think that's ideal going into the SEC. But there is still time. There's not only this portal window, um, and early signing day, but there's also you know later signing day plus the portal opens back up in the spring. Yeah. So we'll we'll see what happens but the other side of it though and i think the the caden green news kind of overshadowed oh all of this is that ou did land a pretty exciting player right before the caden green uh news broke they landed Dion burks a uh, wide receiver out of purdue in the transfer portal and i think that's what yesterday would have been really about the excitement about landing him if the caden green news hadn't dropped um uh, i brian to me Dion burks is a, is a huge get for oklahoma oh, yeah. i mean his his explosiveness um his speed his big playability uh he had uh, 47 catches for almost 700 yards uh this past season for purdue and i think the wide receiver group is always going to be an interesting one to look at for ou because you've still got guys returning, right? Nick Anderson and Jaden Gibson and Jaquay's Padaway and Jalil Farouk, most likely he indicated yesterday that he is probably going to return. Um, but losing Drake Stoops, not only considering his production on the field, he became the number one guy by mm -hmm. the end of the season, but his veteran leadership institutional knowledge, it made the wide receiver group, the group was going to be interesting to look at. Uh, but now you're getting Dion Burks, a guy who has speed and experience on the field. How how big of a get is Dion Burks for this Oklahoma team? It's huge. It's it's really big. Uh, this is this is your slot guy going into next year. Um, what what Stoops brings off the field is just as big as what he has brought on the field this year. And I think that that's still going to be something that has to be replaced. I mean, there, there's going to have to be the leadership on the offensive side of the ball on the field is going to be a big question mark because you don't just lose Dylan Gabriel. Obviously, your quarterback's typically your leader, but you lose Andrew Rame, who was the leader of the of the offensive line room there. Uh, you lose Drake Stoops, who again was just one of the the bigger team leaders. And a guy that 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 showed by example, so you know leadership is is going to be a thing. But I I think as far as production goes, I mean my goodness, you've got you've got more you've got more tools for Jackson Arnold to work with than than he'll ever need. Um, you know, Burks is a guy that he's just extremely twitchy. I know that, that that's probably like a an overused term uh, whenever it comes to recruiting analysis, but this guy has twitch like that. You can see it in his, in his route running. Um, you can see it in, in some of the plays that he makes down the field. I mean, just go watch his 2023 highlights. There's a, there's a, just go look it up on YouTube. Um, his very first highlight of the year is like an 84 yard uh, touchdown against Fresno state. And, you know, there, there are several times where he's making plays on the ball in the air downfield and 
he's just a really good athlete. I think that if, if I was to be a fly on the wall in that discussion between he and, and Emmett Jones before he committed, I just imagine him saying, look what Drake Stoops did in this offense. And we need somebody to fill that role. And, and I, and we'd like you to fill that role. Um, and I think he, he saw that and, and was like, deal, let's do this. Um, he, he's going to be really, really good in this offense if he's utilized properly. And I think what it does is a guy like that. I, I do think Devon Mitchell is going to come in and be a really good tight end for Oklahoma. And then whoever they land in the transfer portal, obviously is going to help too. But I think a guy like that, maybe alleviate some of the issues that, that you might have if you have a lack of depth at, at tight end. That's a guy that um, can really work the middle of the field in the passing game. So um, really good get for the Sooners, and, and Emmett Jones just continues. Is it is it even a heater anymore, or is he just him? I, th- I, think, he might just be, it, I think he might just be him now. Like that, He's just incredible. Emma Jones has been killing it, man. And, and really, to hammer that home, I mean, Brian, he – Deion Burks led Purdue in targets by a lot. 96 targets uh, this regular season, according to Pro Football Focus. The next closest, 47. So he doubled the next receiver in targets, or next closest receiver in targets. Uh, Led this team in receptions, led him in yards, led him in touchdowns with seven. Um, But it's interesting, Brian, because, I mean, he's 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 listed at 5'11", 195. Um, but according to pro football focus, which tracks where, you know, players or wide receivers line up, uh, and, and on any given play, he did play, uh, some in the slot, but he spent a lot of time split out wide 415 mm-hmm. snaps split out wide. Wow. My first thought was, oh, though that's your, that's your slot guy to replace Drake Stoops. And I think that's certainly something they'll probably look to do, but it's interesting because he has experience playing out wide Mm -hmm. and Andrew Anthony, we don't know what his recovery time still looks like. Plus at the slot, you still have Jaquais Petaway. You have Brennan Thompson. I think it's going to be interesting to see how they use Dion. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. Do they put him at, do, I mean, do they put him at the slot? Do they split him out wide? How does that work with Nick Anderson, Jaleel Farouk? What does that mean for the slot receiver position? Uh, obviously, Jaden Gibson still in the mix out wide. I'm pretty curious to see how they utilize him. Yeah. Because um, he's clearly very, very fast. He's not super big. He's not super tall. Um, seems like the slot would be where he would make the most sense for Oklahoma, but he also has played out wide. I, I don't, I mean, and because the other side of it is Jaquais Petaway seems like a guy that's, that's, ready to i mean he showed flashes this year like i think he's a guy that could come in next year and yeah. play but what if dion takes snaps from him him in the slot do, do they do some reshuffling mm-hmm. uh, what is your perspective on that i'm curious to know if if pro football focus if they count if he motions from out outside in because i don't I, you know i didn't watch enough of his film to know but if he if they motion from outside in if they still count that as lining up out at the outside, you know, as the X outside. But um, I think you're right. I I think the biggest thing that you could say about this wide receiver room, just after you going through all of that is it's versatile. I mean, got guys that can fill multiple roles there. I mean, yeah, you've, you've got, obviously you've got Jaden Gibson, who's got size and Nick Anderson's uh, got good size as well. But um, those, those guys like, like Burks now and, and Petaway, they they can be problems anywhere on the field just with their with their speed and elusiveness and how and how well they they run routes. So, um, yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting dynamic because when you add Andrew Anthony back into all that, if he if he gets healthy by season beginning, I mean that room is just it's a it's a question mark, but in a good way if that makes sense. I mean, there's just yeah. you know that there's guys out there that have production. It's just a matter of where they fit into what is going to be somewhat of a new scheme. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, oh, you mentioned that, Brian. That's actually a good segue, and you didn't even do it on purpose. Uh, But that is a good segue (laughs) uh, to talk about. uh, I just kind of wanted to touch on uh, practice yesterday. After practice, we got to talk to um, several different players. We got to talk to Danny Stutzman, got to talk to Billy Bowman, 
and talk about, you know, their decisions to stay and what all went into that. We got to talk to Jalil Farouk, uh, McCain Matower, got to talk to Gentry Williams, got to talk to, most importantly, I think, Jackson Arnold, who obviously the true freshman quarterback is playing or is is the is the guy now with Dylan Gabriel officially uh going off to Oregon. I guess we could have talked about that. Dylan Gabriel <laughs> Dylan he's a, he's going a duck to now. Oregon. <laughs> Did you see where he opens his 2024 season? Hawaii. How freaking cool is that? That's pretty dang I cool. think that I think that's awesome. I really, really and I'm sure that played a factor. Like it had to have. That's that's an awesome that's an awesome thing. So you know what we can we can spare three minutes Absolutely. to talk about yeah. to talk about Dylan Gabriel. I don't know why that didn't come. It, stuff happens so fast in the trend in, in it the feels like that was era, two man. months ago now. And it it that was last week. That was Friday. Yeah. It happened Friday. <laughs> it's five days ago. Wow. Wasn't even a week ago. Yeah. Um I think to me, Brian, I I think it just makes sense. I think the move to Oregon makes sense um for him. Um Oregon's losing Bo Nix. They're going into a new conference. They need an experienced guy at quarterback, um, someone who likes to play fast, up tempo, lead explosive offenses. Dylan Gabriel checks all of those boxes. Yep. He's going to get to go to the West Coast, and you mentioned it there, um, going to Hawaii for the season opener. Uh, big thing. I think that's going to be super, super cool for him. I will say it is interesting that I think Brent Venable's comments during the Alamo Bowl uh, presser were pretty interesting. I mean, he basically said that Dylan Gabriel was welcome to come back if he wanted to, but it's, I mean, every indication this coaching staff gave throughout all of last year mm-hmm. was Jackson Arnold was going to be the guy starting yeah. next year. Um, And Brent also did go further to say that they were planning to go. They were planning not to have Dylan Gabriel next year. And Dylan Gabriel's plan was initially to go to the NFL after the season decided not to decided to go to Oregon and OU had already planned to go ahead with Jackson Arnold starting next season. That has all come to pass, but I don't know. What was your reaction to him going to Oregon? And it was, it was it interesting to hear Brent kind I mean, to Brent outwardly say Dylan could have come back if he wanted to, I'm not trying to stir up any, it's just, it's just interesting. It's an interesting it situation. Is. No, absolutely. It is. I, I think, I think you have, you have a situation with let's let's play the hypothetical if if Dylan was to come back. I think you have a situation where you've got a guy with an immense amount of experience and a lot of a lot of things that he has honed over over his career in college. And on the other hand, you've got a guy that is more talented than he really even knows what to do with at this point in his life. Um, he, he just needs to be he needs to be molded. So, but at what point do you not saying that Dylan Gabriel has limitations that are really going to just cause Oklahoma problems? Cause obviously he didn't this year, he played really well, but I think that some of the things that Jackson Arnold can do given the time he would surpass Dylan Gabriel on, you know, just on a trajectory, if he was to just continue on the path he's been to this point. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting argument. It's interesting to think about. And I did think it was, it was a, kind of a take it taken aback like I was taken aback a bit when I heard when I heard Brent say that. So um yeah it, it is a it is an interesting thing to think about. But I think Oregon, as you just said, I think it's a fantastic landing spot for for Dylan Gabriel. I think it's awesome that he's getting to go to the place where one of his mentors uh or somebody he looked up to, Marcus Mariota, um being from Hawaii, he just, I, I think it's so cool. And it's kind of one of those things where this is a guy that has, he's done it all. I mean, I think he's, he's what, 135 yard yards short of 15,000 career passing yards. Um, you know, he, he is, he's a 4,000 yard season away from being the all time, uh, passing leader in, in the NCAA. So it's like, uh, he can go and do that in Will Stein's offense. I really do think he, he could do that. Um, He's he's surpassed 3,600 yards three times in his career. So, um, you know, we we could see them do that. It would be really cool. And and I'm pulling for Dylan. I mean, he's one of those. He's just a fantastic human being. And any interaction I ever had with him, um, you know, it, he he's always been somebody that's really easy to root for. So, uh, given all of the past history that Oklahoma fans have with hating Oregon for 
for the onside kick and all that stuff. I think I think some of that gets put to the side uh, this year because Dylan Gabriel is somebody that that a lot of fans should be rooting for. I agree, and this is the last thing I'll say. I, I think Dylan Gabriel's legacy at Oklahoma is going to be an interesting one. Mm-hmm. I think he kind of has a unique place um, in compared to the rest of Oklahoma quarterbacks. Um, I, you know, I think the six and seven season last year, I think made things a little bit more complicated, but I would say that, uh, what Dylan Gabriel did to, to come to Oklahoma in a place of major upheaval, you know, a scale of upheaval that most programs don't typically go through very often. And for him to come in as an experienced guy, uh, with a connection to Jeff Levy, um, you know, the offense wasn't perfect either of the last two seasons, but I think most can agree. You dive into the numbers, you watch the film, that the defense was the biggest problem two years ago, not the offense. Yeah, And I think ultimately, not only did oh, Dylan Gabriel do a lot to stabilize the program, Jackson Arnold uh, shouted him out yesterday as a guy that really helped, you know, tutor him this season, really helped lead him and guide him. I think that's going to be huge. Um, but also I think the, the OU Texas game this year with the Dylan, with Dylan Gabriel leading them down the field for a touchdown. I think that alone kind of, I don't know if I'm mortalized that might, that's maybe too strong of a word, but I think that I think he has a good legacy. And I actually think that other stuff will get him remembered more fondly as the years go on is what I, I would say. Yeah. And I agree. I, I think I could, I think you could say immortalized as far as red river, um lore goes uh, it yeah. just just like just like caleb williams um uh, in uh in 2021 whenever he he let them down you know on that amazing comeback those guys will will also all, they'll always have that in in regard to that game so yeah I, I i think i think dylan gabriel is going to be one of the least ballyhooed quarterbacks that that oklahoma has had um get uh, compared to what he deserves uh, I yeah. think just what he did, what he did at Oklahoma during his time, singularly as a, as a, as a player, um, you know, I, I think it's it's going to be something that kind of gets forgotten a little bit. But um, for the for those that sat and watched it, I hope that they enjoyed it because it's not very often that you have a, a program that just uh, shrugs off four thousand total yards and forty two touchdowns in a season like that. That's what he just turned in and. It's incredible that that that's just the that that's the level of of quarterback play that that people have become used to in Norman. So, uh, yeah, hats off to Dylan. Uh, hope he does well in Eugene. Now we turn the clock to Jackson Arnold, which is where I was getting to earlier. But hey, that's the thing about the Oklahoma drill. That's the thing about podcasts. Sometimes you got to be ready to change direction. You got you got to improvise. Okay, you got to be able to make a cut. <laughs> Even if the point of the Oklahoma drill is to go straight ahead and not change direction, we do what we want because this is this is Jesse's podcast that he so graciously allows me to be a part of. Not in our <laughs> Oklahoma drill, you don't move straight forward. <laughs> not in our Oklahoma drill. That's not how we do things. We instead of instead of shrinking the field to a very narrow thing where there's not much space to go horizontally, we use the whole field. Yep. And instead of hitting each other, we Try not to hit each other. Correct. Yeah. Instead it's, of an, it's not an alley drill. This is a highway drill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, perfect example of it here. <clears throat> um, Jackson Arnold, I think his talk with the media yesterday was pretty interesting. Um, I, I think he said a lot of interesting things. I think this bowl game and this, this point kind of got hammered home to me, uh, you know, standing next to him yesterday. This bowl game, I've I've said you can be disappointed about not making New Year's Six Bowl, but this bowl game, but the Alamo Bowl is a big opportunity for Oklahoma for a lot of reasons. It's so big that Jackson Arnold gets 15 practices as the undisputed quarterback one before going to play a really good Arizona team before yeah. they go to the SEC next season. He's Jackson Arnold's going to have a start under his belt against a good team. Yeah, that's huge. And I think it was pretty interesting to hear him hear him talk about that yesterday. And obviously he talked about Seth Luttrell and that um, he sort of said, I mean, he didn't say he had doubts about anything, but he did say that the hire of Seth Luttrell made him feel really good about everything or the elevation of Seth Luttrell, I should say. 
Um, I thought one of the things that was pretty interesting is that in these practices, even with Seth, you know, leading them as the quarterback's coach, play caller, all that stuff, that they're not really changing any of the the language, any of the terminology from Jeff Levy's system, that I think the goal is to kind of establish that chemistry between Jackson Arnold and Seth Luttrell, get them comfortable with each other, yeah. and also make sure Jackson Arnold's comfortable for that game, and that they'll work on shifting and tweaking things to Seth Luttrell's system during the spring. But right now, it's just about kind of continuing Jeff Levy's system and getting them both comfortable. Is that, I mean, is that... Not that that is unexpected, but is that maybe what you kind of expected to happen in these practices, or is that pretty interesting? So uh, I would say that it. this is almost 15 practices. You could almost compare this to – it's so big, right? Like this is such a big – like one of the biggest benefits of making a bowl game is getting those practices. Like – if you don't have those practices and you're done, if you're sitting at home right now, you've got to wait until spring to yeah. to put anything in or to to practice anything. For for him to have 15 practices to work with Seth and get used to one another, it's it's huge. Um, you're getting you're essentially getting two springs to do it. Um, and so it's I would say people expecting something totally different than what we saw from, from Jeff Levy, as far as a system goes are going to be disappointed because they're similar. Uh, they just are. It's everybody, everybody who runs the spread that there's jet sweeps in the spread. I, I hate to tell you that there's, there's screens in the spread. Again, that's just how it RPOs. works. RPOs. Yeah. It, this is all stuff that you're going to see and continue to see until something else comes along in 10 years and makes this obsolete. But for now, that's just how this is. That's how it goes. And so I do think that, you know, that was the the benefit of elevating a guy like Seth Luttrell is that the terminology is relatively consistent. You're going to be able to, he's he's going to have some things that they have to change a little bit and tweak. Um, but it, it is a good thing that, that Gabriel, or excuse me, that, that Arnold has had this, uh, this system, uh, kind of driven into his mind since last spring. And he's, he's still, uh, he's getting first team reps, first team coaching now, um, for the first time. And, and I think that that's, that's uh, going to be a benefit for him in the long run. And the terminology stuff, it, it may switch up a little bit in the off season, but, you know, I, I think with everybody being on the same page and keeping that consistency, uh, it's that's probably one of the bigger reasons why Latrell was the guy. And so I, I think that that's going to be a benefit, a benefit for them uh, going into next year. There was one quote I wanted to highlight yesterday because you kind of said, I mean, the value of him getting first team reps, first team coaching. This was pretty interesting quote from him yesterday. Uh, I want to read it verbatim because I don't want to twist it. Uh, the question was basically, is it more exciting now that you know your quarterback won? He said, no doubt. You know, practice, you have to practice, but as a backup, it does kind of suck a little bit coming out knowing you're not the guy and you're taking less reps. And there's obviously a bigger excitement level coming out knowing that you're the guy and you're going to go out and play. So I think that's, you know, I think it's a pretty interesting quote. You know, I think he I think he knew the, the entire time he was going to sit behind Dylan Gabriel this year, but I think in his head he's been waiting for this opportunity. Yep for a while and that's to me what makes the Alamo Bowl uh, a really big opportunity for him and, and I think a pretty exciting one for fans the yeah. the other thing I was going to mention is obviously I mean Toby Walker was on the field and obviously the the running back uh it announced a few days ago that he was going to enter the transfer portal but he is still on the field um I think I mean with with all indications that he is going to be available for the bowl game that's why I take it back to the Caden Green thing is I think now most of the time a player enters the portal, they leave, right? Mm -hmm. But not every time. There's a lot of outcomes that can happen when a player enters the portal. Or I, I think it's easy to think, well, once they enter the portal, they're gone. Like they're they're officially away from the team. Right. Tawi Walker's still here. Tawi Walker is a walk-on, has been a walk-on since he arrived on campus. All I'm going to say is I think it's pretty interesting that he's still on campus. I think that's pretty interesting that he's still in the bowl prep. Now it is very, very possible 
that he just wants to finish out this year the right way. And then he can, he can go look at offers otherwise, but it is also a pretty risky proposition. If you want to enter the portal to not do it and try to find a team now, because the difference in what's available now compared to three weeks from now could be significantly different. Mm Mm-hmm. But that's, I just wanted to kind of mention that, not even really for discourse. I just kind of wanted, wanted to mention that. Um, the other thing, or I mean, the last thing I was going to kind of ask, Brian, is is outside of Jackson Arnold, who we all know this is a big thing, you know, it's a big opportunity for him, this bowl game. Danny Stetson's back. Billy Bowman's back. There's a lot of freshmen who are going to see more opportunities because of the guys who've entered the portal. Who's maybe a guy offensively or defensively or both that you think these bowl practices – it's not only a huge opportunity for them, but the bowl game could be an opportunity to raise their stock. Cause you look at Jalil Farouk, the Alamo bowl two years ago was huge for him. Mm-hmm. He didn't really play most of that season, had a big game against Oregon, then became a starter. Is there who, who on this team is a guy that could have that kind of trajectory? So I've been thinking about there's, there's been a trio of guys on offense. Um, not that I knew this question was coming, but that it's something that I've been thinking about, especially with Caden green leaving, Joshua Bates is a big one. That's a guy that's got to have a role um, and, and got to uh, seize the role and run with it. So that that's one. That's an easy one. And then, you know, with Tawi Walker, it kind of throws this one off a little bit. But I think Javante Barnes and Caleb Hicks, just because the running back room next year is just, is going to be deep. I mean, it's just, there's there's going to be. Uh, you're you're adding Taylor Tatum. Um, you know, there's there's a good chance Oklahoma's adding somebody in the transfer portal pretty soon. You know, you've got some some really good pieces there already. I think one of those guys, you know, we've seen what Javante Barnes can be whenever he's healthy. Uh, this is the best chance he's gonna have had to be healthy. So uh I, I think that those are two really big pieces. Um defensively. Who is who's the guy that's going to step in next to Danny Stutzman? Like, is is Kip Lewis going to solidify his hold there? Uh, is is Jaron Cannon going to be able to get things back on track and be the guy that everybody had hoped he was going to be? Um, you know, you, you need somebody to to step in there and be ready to take over uh, whenever when when Danny decides. You know, whenever Danny's done next year after his eligibility runs out. So. Uh, you know, this, these are things that they're they're probably looking for on the staff, uh, and so I would be I would be interested to see uh, which of those guys defensively steps in and does that. Yeah, I, I like those picks. The only really thing I'll add is I'm pretty I'm pretty curious to see um, to see Peyton Bowen, what things look like for him. He dealt with injuries yeah. through a lot of the season that limited his playing time. Key Lawrence is in the portal. Um, you know, this is Reggie Pearson's last college game, so he's going to get a lot of run. Obviously, Billy Bowman's going to get a lot of run, but I'm curious to see how much Peyton Bowen plays. I mean, do the do these do these few weeks between the regular end of the regular season and the bowl game does that give him a chance to heal up? Do the coaches mm-hmm. give him more run? Because you know, obviously, Reggie Pearson's not going to be here next year. Is Peyton Bowen is this an opportunity to get him a lot of snaps? Yeah. Now, now that he's healthy. Yeah, I think. I think that's the only other name I'll add to what you've said. And also I'm going to add Jaden Gibson just because he didn't uh, – Jaden Gibson made a lot of big plays this year um, but didn't really see any increased playing time after Angel Anthony went out. I think he averaged 15.3 snaps per game before Angel Anthony's injury. He averaged 16.0 after, so basically less than one snap more per game. Hmm. Pretty curious to see what his involvement is offensively brian i think the only other thing really we're recording this podcast on a wednesday afternoon is currently 2 30 uh the sec schedule comes out tonight the full sec schedule so by the time people are listening to this they will already know what ou's schedule is next season and we know the opponents we just don't know uh when those games will be except Mm -hmm. for alabama right which is november 23rd in norman and then uh, that Tennessee game as well, right? Which is September 21st. Yes. I believe that's correct. Yep, I believe so. So we know those two games, but we don't know. Uh, we don't know the, I mean, we don't really know the non-conference or the other conference games. We don't know the order of those games. 
what are you most excited? What game are you most excited to see? Let's use this as a prediction time, maybe kind of for people who will already be listening to this, knowing the schedule. What are you most looking forward to? And what game are you most excited to see where it lands? So per FB schedules, we have Temple Owls on August 31st. September 7th is Houston. September 14th is Tulane. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tennessee is September 21st. October 26th is Ole Miss. I think that was leaked by the Ole Miss side of things. And then obviously, like you said, uh, November 23rd against Bama. I think the one that I'm going to be most intrigued by is where the LSU game lands. Um, I, you know, where that one lands could be big for, for Oklahoma. The other one, Uh, As I kind of threw into our group chat, I'm interested to see how the SEC handles the Oklahoma-Texas game because typically, more often than not, Oklahoma and Texas play on the second Saturday in October. That is, uh, you know, there have been years when it's been the first Saturday, but more often than not, it's the second Saturday in October. If they do that, Texas will have to play Oklahoma and Dallas and play Georgia the very next week in Austin. So that would that's be tough. extremely tough for, for Texas. Um, but you know, that's, that's just how it is. So I'm looking forward to those two. And then obviously I'm, I'm really excited about Oklahoma's travel to, to Auburn. I, I want to go see, obviously I'm ready to go see that one. So, um, I'll be, I'll be looking for those three, but th- those would be my, my biggest ones. I'm going to say, I'm going to say Oklahoma's game following Texas is going to be South Carolina. I think that's where it's going to be. It's going to be Texas, then South Carolina. Um, and then I think after that, you get into, into Oct or into uh, Ole Miss. So we'll see how it plays out, but uh, that would be my guess right now. We'll check back later to see if that, if that comes through, we'll also check the comments on YouTube uh to see uh <laughs> to see if if not only if anybody had their own predictions but what they thought about your predictions and how it stacked up with I'm uh, sure it'll be great. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it'll be great. Uh no, I agree with you Brian. I think the only thing uh, I'm the only thing I'll add is not even adding but um ex- excited to see where LSU lands on the schedule. I think that's going to be pretty interesting and um I'm really curious to see where the home and away games shake out. I mean, OU opens the season with four straight home games. So I'm curious to see where they stack in. Yeah. You know, obviously we know Old Miss on October 22nd, but or over 26th. Sorry. So now I'm curious to see how they stack the home and road games. We know no 23rd is or November 23rd is a home against Alabama. Mm-hmm. So I'm just pretty uh pretty curious about that. But we'll see. Brian at the end of it though, it's again it should be a busy few days. That C schedule comes out tonight. Uh we've got more transfer portal things to get through we've got we've got more open practices brent venables is going to speak to the media on friday there should be plenty of interesting things that he has to say during that meeting with the media and the next week is early signing day i think we a week from the week from today i think it's a week from today it is so um yeah a lot of stuff going on right now brian and then uh then the alamo bowl the week after that so I think that's going to do it for us here, Brian, at uh, the Oklahoma Drill, a podcast fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. If you are not a VIP member over at OUinsider.com, go ahead and head over there. There is tons of behind-the-scenes scuttlebutt on all things transfer portal and recruiting. Uh, Plus, you'll get plenty of content from myself, from Brian, from Parker, from Brandon. Uh, Basketball season is in full swing Uh, You'll get plenty of recruiting stuff from uh, Brody, and you'll also get plenty of team coverage from myself. OU's 9-0 under Porter Moser, ranked 11th in the country. Got a big game against North Carolina next week. Brody and I also started a new basketball show podcast uh, that will air every week, I think on Mondays, on this YouTube channel. That is just one of several offerings we have here. In addition to the Oklahoma Drill, we have – the quick slants video series with me and Parker. We have the under the visor podcast. We have the field vision series provided by yours truly, Brian Clinton. Uh, so if you don't feel like going over to OUinsider.com just yet, even though you should, 
You can always like and subscribe to this YouTube channel to get everything we're offering, content every single day of the week. Brian, I'm a little bit scared about what's to come in the next few days <laughs> after what's happened the last couple days. We'll see. Before before we leave, I need to give you 20 seconds unabated. Okay. How happy are you that the Thunder are remaining in, in Oklahoma City for the next you know, for the foreseeable future? I'm really glad you mentioned that. Uh, I'm ecstatic. Um, now, I'm not going to – look, I, <laughs> this is always complicated for me because I'm not saying I don't understand maybe the pessimism over the vote or mm-hmm. the no votes. I get that. And I do think there are things that we can do. You know, that's a whole, that's a whole other discussion at the end of the day, what the Oklahoma Thunder, what the Oklahoma city thunder has done for this, for Oklahoma city, what is done for the state is completely transformed yep. everything. It is so big that we have an NBA team and couple that with the fact that this team right now has the brightest future in the NBA. They're the second seed in the West a true blue superstar and Shea Gilgis Alexander and a bunch of exciting young guys. It's hard. I'm not going to gloat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to brag too much, but I am excited that this past I'm excited that the thunder are here to stay for another 30 years. I'm a huge, huge thunder fan, like huge, huge thunder fan. I watch every game. So this is, it's pretty exciting for me. So thank you for, thank you for giving me the unfiltered time there, Brian. I appreciate yeah, that. No, I agree with you hundred percent. It's exciting. So, well, that's some good news. Maybe Oklahoma will have some, maybe Oklahoma will have some more good news heading its way, but until then, Brian, we'll be here to break it all down on the Oklahoma drill next week. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next week.